My name is Anat Admati, and I am the founder and faculty director of the Cooperation Society Initiative, CASI, here at Stanford. CASI, I know now precisely because I went back to the history. Uh, so CASI is in its sixth year right now, um, I think. And um, our guest uh, was the visited for our second ever event, which happened five years exactly, almost to the day, on February 5th, uh, 2019. And that event was called From Tesla to Wells Fargo, Scandal, Success, and Accountability in Corporate America. That panel, which by the way, brought C-SPAN to videotape it, because it was so weird, the mix of people we brought, um, had uh, on it, I moderated it, and it had uh, Judge Rakoff, Judge Rakoff, Jed Rakoff, a judge in the Southern District of New York who we've had since uh, to talk about fraud and the legal system with uh, Bethany McLean a few, a couple of years ago. Uh, Fami Kadir, our guest today, Chief Investment Officer of Secret Capital, uh, will be introduced later. Uh, and we had also Emily Glazer, who is a Wall Street Journal reporter, who at the time was the Wells Fargo connection because she reported on the West Fargo accounts opening scandal that had just happened. Since then, she wrote a lot on Credit Suisse and other corporate governance issues. And the description of that event uh, this, it was our second. Our first one had uh, John Carreyrou, the author of Bad Blood on Theranos. So this is, a, you can see, a little bit of a theme here about you know what might go wrong uh, in corporate governance as, govern, govern, as corporations you know, in, interact with society. Uh, it said, recent uh, cases in many business sectors illustrate the preventable harm caused and millions of dollars of fines paid by corporations in the United States and elsewhere. From long-standing issues like financial fraud to emerging questions like consumer data privacy, business leaders are sticking, seeking better approaches to address these challenges and avoid negative publicity, short sellers hitting, betting against the company, and legal jeopardy. So we were talking about three ways in which outsiders can try to uh, interject themselves into corporate governance uh, by reporting it in the media, by judging cases in the courts if they come in, and by selling short, betting against a company, particularly the business model of our visitor, which looks for corporate fraud uh, to, to short sale. To help prepare Stanford GSB future business leaders, the Corporations and Society Initiative is convening a conversation with three experts in legal, reputational, and financial risk to explore the causes of and solution to corporate scandals. The Tesla connection, by the way, was because our guest dared at that time to have a short position in Tesla, uh, which fortunately, by the time she came back four years ago, exactly, uh, or, or so also in February 2020, right before COVID, and I remember it because it was a leap year like this one, uh, and she was here on February 29th, um, she uh, got out of that position, whereas other people got killed uh, shorting Tesla uh, at that time. So uh, without further ado, Cassie is uh, powered by passion of faculty, staff, and students. And we have student leaders, and they often moderate events. In fact, we have a record-breaking second in one year moderation by our leader, Tom Newcomb. And we have Rachel over here, who I hope uh, will moderate later in the year, uh, taking the Zoom calls. And without further ado, I'll let Tom take it from here. Thank you. Sir. I uh, consider myself very lucky to be uh, moderating for a second time. And a huge thank you to Professor Edmondi for, for making this happen. We are so excited today to welcome Fami Kadir here. Fami, you are the not only the CIO of Softkit Capital, but you are also the founder of Netflix fame from Dirty <laughs> Money, Valiant Pharmaceuticals to Wirecard, and now most recently in the news for Ad Talon. Thank you so much for your generosity and time and candor. Welcome to Stanford. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to be on campus, and it's been unfortunate that it's been almost you know four years since I've been here. Um, but I did move to London, so this is a transatlantic journey and then a transcontinental journey to get here. So I hope you guys will enjoy the conversation. We really appreciate it, and I'll I'll add for a second goal today to have you uh, welcome back in the future. So that's that's our second goal. I think for our primary goal, 
I would love to end this hour with a better understanding of you, with a better understanding of you as a short seller and what that means for our capital markets, and then maybe how regulation and market dynamics either hurts or, or hinders that. So that's my goal for today. In, Heavy topic. <laughs> in suit of that goal, I've got about four questions lined up, but as everyone that knows me can tell you, I'll talk for this whole hour <laughs> if the audience uh, doesn't prevent me from doing it. So hopefully they will be asking for most of those questions. Your audience today is as a mix of folks. Some like me, I'm a, a JD MBA, I don't have a financial background. There are some investors in here that are experts. Yeah. But what they all have in common is that they're here to listen to you. On a day they could be going to Tahoe and an epic snow day. So thank <laughs> you, audience. Uh, in, in that pursuit of getting to know you, can you tell us how a meeting at the National Institute of Mathematics <laughs> led you to short selling? Yeah, so um, if you haven't seen Dirty Money, my background isn't in finance or business. Um, I studied math and biology. I was um, embarking on a PhD in mathematics. So at the time that I moved back to New York City, um, they were building the Museum of Mathematics, uh, which happens to be funded by hedge funds, largely. Renaissance Technologies is the biggest funder. Um, so it's funny because Back when I was a teenager, I got a grant from Jim Simons, the founder of Renaissance, to go do physics research as a kid. So I worked in the lab, and I got money from this guy, Jim Simons, who I didn't really know other than he was a benefactor. Um, I didn't know much about the hedge fund industry. But then um, you know, being exposed to it, I, I never considered myself someone who would ever work in finance. It just didn't really match up with um, what I sought to do with my life. I, I was kind of obsessed with the pursuit of knowledge. And it didn't really, uh, I didn't see how I could contribute to my community through finance. Um, but at some point, you know, I realized, you know, there's something about capital markets. They have power. Investors have power. They have power to affect change. Um, so the board at the, the museum introduced me to a few funds that, I mean, you know, you don't need to go work for them, but maybe take a meeting, see what they do, and see what happens. Um, so that's exactly what I did. And I guess through that interview with me, the, the, the portfolio manager of a fund thought, whoa, this girl is a natural short seller. And at the time, <laughs> I had never shorted a stock in my life. So I just ran with it. Tell us what it means to be a natural short seller, and then maybe just a primer on short selling for those of us who uh, might not be familiar. Yeah, so we'll start with um, what is short selling. Um, short selling means you borrow shares from your bank. Um, you sell those shares immediately. And the hope is that the, the price of those shares will go down. So you can buy back that share to pay your, your broker um, at, and, and pocket the gain from you know high to low. Um, but as you can imagine, with stocks Prices, you know, they can go up infinitely, right? So the uh, losses on a short are also infinite. Um, so there's that. Um, but what I do as a short seller is I specifically try to find companies that may be engaged in fraud or um, predatory practices because if you are abusing your end consumer, um, that's ultimately bad for business. Um, they, they aren't going to continue to be your consumer. Um, and I realized that you can make a fundamental case um, to short these companies based on, on fraud, um, even legal fraud or predatory practices. Um, so what does it mean to be a short seller? It means you are willing to take infinite losses, potentially. Uh, you're willing to make losses most of the time, right? Because until the, the stock price actually goes down, it's very likely that the, pri the price will go up or be kind of stagnant in the interim. Um, so you have to be OK with that. Um, you also have to be OK with being counter to whatever the prevailing narrative is. And that narrative is created by the companies themselves and then reinforced by their investor base, by the sell side analysts. Um, and by society at large, because I think we all want businesses to succeed. We all like to see stock prices go to the moon. Um, so a short seller has to be OK with all of that and stand with conviction. Um, and it's really difficult to develop conviction. And that's why you see very few short sellers in the market that actually do what I do. Most short selling in the market is done on a systematic basis. 
Um, so you have machines, algorithms um, that are shorting, and um, it's important. Shorting is important for the functioning of our markets. Uh, they provide liquidity, they provide price discovery, um, but in a small, small, tiny corner of the market, uh, there are those of us who are using short selling as a way to expose injustice and um, correct bad capital markets behavior. Thank you for that. You've given us so many threads to sort of pull on there from, from your resiliency, sort of unspoken perhaps, is to be a good short seller, to not evaporate immediately in sort of six months. There, there is a trick there that hopefully you can share with us uh, to your impact for, for greater social good. I'm curious, when I look at short selling and overvalued companies generally, to me it seems like there's four buckets. There's companies who are misunderstood somehow fundamentally. Yeah. There's the second sort of mass delusion or perhaps delusion of founders. Uh, then there's fraud. There's fraud to the shareholders, so maybe think Enron or, or later Wirecard. And there's fraud to the customers, maybe yeah. payday lo uh, lending or we might say for-profit universities. Yeah. Is that about right? Is there a difference that's that you see fundamentally between that or that you look at as a short seller? Yeah, so for us, we, we like to find companies that are in this bucket of fraud or you know unethical practices. Um, because that's stuff that we can dig into. We can go out in the world, we can do field work to verify these things, and that gives us informational alpha versus the market. Because most people that are investing in these names, analyzing them, are doing so from their, you know, their comfy seat in front of a Bloomberg terminal. So any additional information and evidence we can collect um, to establish our thesis is critical. Um, we avoid situations of mass delusion or hype. Uh, because mass delusion can stay delusional forever, um, and that's really just, you know, you're asking to get run over. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, going back to this idea, how haven't I evaporated? You really, as a short seller, you have to consider your longevity. You have to understand all of these different events, every single name you short, and the amount of money you can lose on those names is going to leave some kind of battle wound. And you don't want those battle wounds to become permanent and just burn you out. Because to do this, you, you have to have a healthy risk appetite. It's not easy. And you don't want to be in situations where you're afraid to make a decision because you see the stock running against you. In those situations, you really need to batter, batter down and just do more work. You need to keep the uh, peace of mind and the, the coolness of mind in those issues, in, in those moments where the market's running against you, where the stock is running against you, where the narrative is running against you, and just really be able to focus on your work, on your thesis, on reevaluating your thesis, and make um, sometimes split-second decisions. That notion of sort of when to jump in, this idea of when delusion actually becomes fraud, I think Wirecard is, is a great sort of platform to talk about that. This yeah. company that started off in the, in the early aughts and sort of took off in what, what may be called the, the sort of golden age yeah. of fraud. Can you walk us through that case study and sort of uh, your thinking along, the, along that process? So as short sellers, we like to think as storytellers. Um, we like to understand you know, what's the genesis of a company and how does that company evolve, um, you know, either through the, the evolution of the executives and new executives coming in, um, through the business decisions they make, such as acquisitions, and Wirecard is just one of those really, really rich stories. Um, so if you go back to the, the birth of Wirecard, I'm going to tell you a story that hasn't really been written anywhere. It's, it's, this is um, you know, from living and breathing Wirecard for as long as I did. This is going to be interesting. GSP exclusive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so in the early days, uh, when it was just Marcus Brown and uh, Jan Marslik, who is now you know, a confirmed Russian agent, uh, <laughs> the two of them had developed the patents for the Wirecard's um, digital wallet. Um, and they were you know, think, trying to raise money, uh, trying to build the business. And then uh, they get approached by an Austrian billionaire who was known for being the first one to start di taking digital payments for pornography. Um, this, this guy was quite a character. Um, so he approaches the Wirecard founders, um, you know, this is before 2000, um, and says, you know, I really like your business. I want to acquire your business. They say, no, uh, we're going to grow this business on our own. We have a plan in place. About a week later, the, the offices for Wirecard get raided. Um, you know, they're burglarized. 
all of the technology was stolen, everything was ruined. And then after that, they get a fax. And they get a fax from that Austrian billionaire. And he said, are you ready to be acquired now? now? <laughs> <laughs> so when, when that's the, the story, of near origin story, you know that the, you know, whatever comes after is going to be Wild. epic, yeah. right? <laughs> um, so one of our favorite ways to get high conviction shorts is to look at people, um, at, at targets, at companies that have faced a history of short sellers, of um, you know, news uh, media coverage on various allegations, and Wirecard had it all. Um, you know, back in like 2008, 2009, investors in Wirecard, shareholders of Wirecard were actually imprisoned, arrested for market wow. manipulation after they had raised various concerns around money laundering at Wirecard. Um, so we knew there, you know, where there's smoke, there's usually something more. Um, and we also know that as companies kind of evade justice um, for as long as Wirecard did, the, and given the narcissism of the executives there, uh, there really was this idea that they were too big to fail. And you know, they had the whole regulatory environment in Germany. Uh, this was the one tech company that they had. Um, so there was no scrutiny internally within, within Germany. So the company really felt they could get away with everything. So you know, fast forward to 2017, we're taking a look at it with fresh eyes. And at the time, the company had just done a deal in the United States which again is crazy because you know Europe may not care much about money laundering, but the United States <laughs> certainly did, and um, you know this was right on the heels of you know, the Magnitsky Act and you know, sanctions on Russian oligarchs. So, we you know when you're buying a company in the U.S., you're being exposed to U.S. jurisdiction, um, and if you're money laundering, that means you're 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 within the financial system of the United States. Finally, there's no way you can avoid that. Um, and the thing was that they bought a prepaid card business. Um, so I don't know how much you guys know about prepaid cards. Um, you, you, they're usually like gift cards you can buy, um, like $500 or whatever. Wirecard had $100,000 gift cards. Wow. Um, and you can reload them. And there was no like, an amount of like know your customer procedures around it. So I could go to Wirecard offices and say, hey, I'm a drug you know, cartel guy, but you know, I own this laundromat. Can I buy some prepaid cards? And it's like, like pre-crypto yeah. crypto. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That's a really good point. So, <laughs> so part of this was actually, this business decision came on the heels of the rise of digital assets and crypto. Um, because as you all know, crypto, it's a lot easier to, to launder money in a system that has very little regulation. Um, so a lot of the money behind Wirecard started to pull their money out of Wirecard and into crypto and digital assets. And that causes a problem when your main business is laundering money. Because in <laughs> order to keep your profits up, you need to keep maintain those volumes of transactions and that, that volume of money coming in and out. Uh, so they were really struggling in 2017. So when we're looking at it from like our bird's eye point of view, it seemed like the writing was on the wall. Um, so we dug into this deal in the US. Um, and then you, you know, fast forward, we had whistleblowers who came to us um, to provide information. They were, um, for, they were basically competitors of Wirecard. Um, and they saw that Wirecard was in collapse, so they wanted to get ahead of it um, because they were afraid of potential legal retribution for them. Um, so we, we got that information. And then um, in about the summer of 2019, we went to the DOJ and the FBI and presented our findings. Um, and then. In 2020, uh, actually around the time that I was speaking at Stanford, uh, the DOJ then made arrests for the, let's say, the, the US-based kingpin of, of Wirecard. And that really, once that happened, we knew that we feel pretty safe shorting this in size. Um, so we're going from 2017 to 2020, right? It's, and there's a lot of work that happens in between. Um, and at, you can't maintain your sh whole short position that entire time, right? You have to be able to trade around it, but that doesn't stop you from actually going and doing all of the work necessary to ultimately build the conviction you need to have, what, as we did, a 25% short position in Wirecard um, in you know, the early spring of 2020, um, just a month or two before 
the eventual downfall. That is an incredible story. And it strikes me odd for a lot of reasons, one of which Europe oh, just very recently, within the last 12 months, actually created an anti-money laundering <laughs> authority. You would have thought that maybe they would have done this in 2017. I think that builds into my next question, which is in markets, both market dynamics and in, inside of this regulation system that you spoke about, there seems to be an incentive for a growth narrative rather than a short narrative. Is, is that fair assumption? I think that's the, that's the case for everyone. No, regulators never want to stand in the way of a boom period, right? They don't want to be the one to, to take their, the power of enforcement and bring that hammer down on a company that is in the middle of growth. Because what does that mean for the rest of the economy, right? There's, a, there's always going to be collateral damage uh, when there is strict enforcement. Um, so regulators kind of, tr it's, a, it's a political position, right? They don't want to cause drama. So even if they're aware of these, these weaknesses and these potential issues down the line, they don't want to have to be the ones to, to pull the, push the button first. Um, and then it usually falls on other, other actors in the, the ecosystem. And, and who does that end up being? Usually it's, it could be whistleblowers. But of course, um, with the case of whistleblowers, you know, they're taking on sometimes you know, you know, grave risk, mortal risk, career risk, um, in order to expose some of this stuff. Um, so it rarely happens. But then you, of course, have the media, who is positively incentivized to report on this, because you get such a reputational boost um, if you're able to expose a big scandal, and then short sellers like me, we're also positively incentivized because well, we make money if we're right. I'm glad that you brought those other stakeholders in, especially in the wire card uh, scenario. So you've gone to the regulators, you're going to the, these folks that yeah. that own the stock. The, the only way it seems to do that to me is either go directly or go to investor meetings. Are you showing mm -hmm. up at investor meetings asking these questions, stirring things up? Um, so we, we first went directly to the regulator. Um, we went to Germany's securities regulator, which is Boffin, um, because they had instituted a short selling ban in Wirecard. And that was kind of our first big exposure. Um, I just want to mention something about this, because in the aftermath of Wirecard, um, the man who was head of short selling at Boffin, who we wrote our letter to, that man was at the dentist's office the day that the short selling ban was put in place. So basically, Boffin, the securities regulator, received a fax. I don't know why they use a lot of faxes in Germany, but they received a fax from the public prosecutor's office in Bavaria saying that they recommend a short selling ban. And that, that decision was made when the expert within Boffin was not in the office. It's, see. <laughs> It seems very specifically timed. Yeah, it's it's absolutely insane. Yeah. Um, and you, know, it, it, I, I was grateful at the end of it all um, for the um, the finance minister when he came to New York after everything was said and done. He actually apologized on behalf of Germany. You know, we're sorry we we ignored your many efforts to tell us and, and warn us in advance. Um, but after that happened, we did we had the opportunity to actually see Wirecard um, executives in person. Because they, um, in the middle of all of this, this was 2019, they came to New York for an investor day to inspire confidence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't publicize it. Uh, so you, it was very difficult to actually find where it was going to be. Um, but, but we found it. And you know, we just casually walked in. Uh, they knew who I was. Um, and, the thing was, they, they couldn't make a scene, right? The, the company wasn't going to say, Fami, you're, we're not allowing you in. So they took, their, you know, they, they took a chance and allowed me to attend. Um, I showed up a little bit late so I could strategically find a seat for myself. Much like our audience. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, um, I was able to sit right behind Marcus Brown. And he Incredible. had no idea. <laughs> he had no idea that I had walked in yet. So I saw, like, he was frantically, like, on his phone, he was getting these text messages, she's behind you, she's behind you. <laughs> uh, so th that was really, that was fun. Um, and then uh, during, after, you know, the, the conference portion, they, they had, like, little stations set up with various Wirecard employees from all over the world. And one of the employees was actually the guy that I talked to about prepaid cards. The, they were the North American sales executive of the prepaid cards. He was there, and he's like, hey, Fami, <laughs> you know, you've, uh, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm going to, oh, he said, I'm, 
I'll be more careful about what I say to you this time. <laughs> That's too late. Yeah. I, I love that image of you just sitting behind the CEO. I feel like that's every CEO's worst nightmare. I, I don't know why I get under their skin because when I go to conferences or investor days, I, I just sit mostly in the back. I don't ask any questions. I don't do anything. Um, there was another uh, company. It was called Health Insurance Innovations. Has gone bankrupt ever since. But uh, I was I went to the investor day and the CEO spots me. And like the, one of the board members uh, knew who I was, and so did the CEO. I mean, he was writing these notes up to the CEO. Um, basically, they wanted to engage in some kind of like battle with me at the <laughs> investor day. Um, so at some point, the, the CEO, he's like puffing up his chest, and he's like, oh, um, does the lady in red have any questions? I wasn't even wearing red. I was wearing <laughs> black, but all he saw was red. Uh, <laughs> And yet, even with this latest short, again, we, all we did was put out a report. We, we, we made some noise when we did that, but I haven't been engaging in some sort of, um, you know, I'm not out there tweeting about the company or, or t talking about the CEO or anything. But you know, today, he followed me on Twitter because I guess he's really nervous. He's been, you know, doing the whole media circuit, trying to say that I'm short and distort. But and if anyone looks at the... Uh, the stock price, I, there's no short and distort there. <laughs> short and distort, pump and dump. Yeah. Is, whatever is anti them, at yeah. least they come up with a cute nickname for yeah. it. All right, this is the audience warning that this is my uh, last prepared question, and then I promise I'll go to you. Uh, otherwise, Elena will call me out on it, which I appreciate. So th that's a perfect segue to talk about what you're, what you're doing today. Mm -hmm. So a little bit different. Previously, although you were in Netflix, you were yeah. mostly talking directly to shareholders, yes. sort of under the radar. This is a little bit odd for, for you. Can you tell yeah. me sort of why that's the case and what's going on with that talent today? Yeah. So you know, running a short fund for as long as I have, I've seen, um, I was mentioning this in class, the, the people I went to for advice, the fund managers, I went to advice on how to run a short fund. Those guys are out of business. The people that came to me for advice about how to start their short funds, those guys are also out of business. It's very hard to be a short seller and um, to actually run a fund and, and make it a sustainable business model. Um, so you know, it's a learning process, figuring out what's the right way for us to do things. And I'm an adaptive person. Um, so yeah, we've, we've been very quiet. And well, though we've been activists, it's mostly just been behind the scenes engaging with shareholders, regulators. Um, we realized that we have a powerful tool, which is our voice, you know, the, our research. Um, so we felt in this specific situation, it made sense for us to utilize it because there was an informational vacuum around this company. Uh, the, the shareholder base was largely passive or long only. Um, so no one was doing the kind of research or analysis that we were doing. Um, and on top of that, though the company itself is you know, smaller you know, in market cap than a Valiant or a Wirecard, the amount of money it takes from the government and abuses is far greater. Um, and that's why we felt it made sense. You know, this is, these are taxpayer losses um, that no one is actually talking about. And we could offer a new discussion that could lead to better solutions of what to do with it, especially as we think about um, you know, the student loan crisis and, and the deficit. And how's it gone so far? <laughs> Um, well, my feedback from my investors is that it's been perfect execution. So <laughs> that's the only opinion that matters, and I, I'll take it. 19% <laughs> drop immediately, close to immediately after yeah. your report came out. Uh, a freak out hold of about an hour, and then another 10% drop after that is, I believe, yeah, about right. Yeah, this is crazy. So the company yesterday halted shares, halted trading in the shares for over an hour just to say, to release this this you know, BS press release, let's be fair, um, to call me a, a, you know, a manipulator, a short and distort artist, which again, it was very satisfying after that hold was released for me to see the market validate that, no, I'm, she's not a short and distort artist. <laughs> and, and the company expecting that, that whole charade and that drama to per perhaps um, pump their shares, it did have the actual opposite effect. Um, but never have I seen that before. Um, of course, we've seen shorts that halt their shares, but they'll usually release some kind of you know, bullish thing like 
accelerated share buybacks or some kind of strategic investment or some kind of advisory committee. They never do it just to like try to rebut the short seller. And this was two, three days after the report came out. So it, it was boneheaded move on their part, but I'm not complaining. <laughs> to the audience. Well, sorry. I'm Fiona Sequera. I'm a PhD student in accounting at the GSB, and so naturally I'm curious how you factor financial accounting information into your due diligence you perform on this company. Yeah, so I was reminded that one line I use a lot is accountants don't make good short sellers. <laughs> <laughs> and that is because the level of accounting issues, not necessarily fraud, but accounting issues and misrepresentation is so high across all publicly traded companies. And it is something that you know, the SEC is looking at, um, especially as we're looking at like, the reliance now on non-GAAP metrics. Uh, it's insane, right? So you can create an accounting narrative to short something for most companies, even the, the ones that aren't actually committing fraud. Um, but that being said, the accounting piece is really something that we can use as a catalyst because it will help us understand you know, what is fundamentally going on at the company and assess like, what's the level of weakness where the fundamentals might shift um, from you know, being a growth story to no longer being a growth story. Um, in a more recent case, um, we, were, we have been short a company called Ebix. Um, and this is a company whose auditor, I mean, there's auditor turnover like basically every few months. They, didn't, they weren't even able to get any American auditors to audit them anymore. So they went to India and got some, a literally like a family run audit firm that doesn't even audit any publicly traded companies in India. And somehow the SEC was okay with this, but that's another story. Um, so we saw all of this and what, you know, in a, we tried to try something new. Um, and we wrote a letter about the auditor and their audit failures of this company, Evix and we sent it to the public co uh, company accounting oversight board. And they were very responsive because apparently like auditor, like regulators that don't get overloaded with tips are gonna be happy to receive tips. And this was the first time I think that they actually engaged directly with an investor, a short seller. Um, so they, they responded immediately. Um, you know, they had multiple calls with me. Um, they were very grateful for the information, and they said, you know, is it okay if we send this to the SEC, blah, blah, blah. And about a year later, the, the PCOB then sanctioned the auditor. Um, and then a few months after that, the company declared bankruptcy. So you have to be creative. I th accounting is, of course, a critical part. Um, but for us, it's, you know, it's just a matter of you know, how can we use accounting to ultimately result in price discovery. Sure. So once you, uh, thank you for being here first of all, and then once you have a thesis, how long do you allow, allow for it to play out? I know it's very company and situation specific, but can you give a ballpark of different experience you have had because you cannot go on making losses for like a long duration? Exactly. I, I think short sellers are just as vulnerable to this idea of thesis creep. Um, and you know, the longer you allow a thesis to sort of stagnate, the, the more likely you are um, to be susceptible to, to thesis creep. So for us, we're as dynamic as possible. Um, and that might mean that we have, so with this case at Tellum that we just released a report on, we first started developing a thesis on it in 2017. And we never shorted shares in it until December of 2023. So we realize we're in a long game in the sense that we are developing industry expertise, we're developing sources, we, there's a lot that goes in to developing our thesis. It's not just as simple as us pulling financial statements and coming up with a model. Um, we really try to immerse ourselves and understand the rules and regulations, the laws that govern the, the competitive um, side of it, the ecosystem, and then sometimes we do all of that work and realize the timing is not on our side. Um, so we just wait, we just wait for the, the right moment. Um, and in this case, um, Atellum had acquired a very low quality for-profit school called Walden University and took on a ton of expensive debt to do so. And they overpaid for it, according to their own former executives uh, who we interviewed. So we felt you know, this is a fundamental catalyst that will allow us um, to really start building conviction so we can have a large position um, being shorted. In back. 
No go to Atlanta and Neutrons. Okay. Hi, I'm Chanu. Actually, I was a regulator for short selling in South Korea. Oh. <laughs> so I actually, <laughs> I actually have two questions. Um, so first part is that when you short sell, you actually know that you are also causing a damage to retail investors who are in these stocks. And you don't also know that like the sentiment towards short sellers are generally not great, as you can see from GameStop. Mm -hmm. So first, like how do you weigh the damage you cause to retail investors? Mm -hmm. And second, how do you deal with the like general sentiment after the mm -hmm. stock tanks? So I'd like to kind of flip this narrative around. When when you short something like Wirecard, it's not the short sellers who are causing the, the drop in the stock. It's because the company committed fraud. And fraud is the number one reason people lose money. Short seller coming out can turn um, you know, short-term losses. Um, you know, yeah, there's a short-term loss, but it's not irreversible loss. Whereas fraud, can be, that's irreversible loss. Um, so if anything, short sellers are doing a service to the retail investors, allowing them ample warning, opportunity to reassess their thesis and their position. Um, so that's what I have to say about that. Short sellers are not the reason companies go bankrupt. Um, as far as the sentiment, I, I, I don't think that I'm going to be able to change uh, the, the PR for short selling because short selling is one of the most ancient forms of um, activity in capital markets, yet it's never been positively viewed. Um, I don't think that's going to change with you know, one short seller who's using social justice as a means to, to, to sell short. Um, so that's just, that's an, you acknowledge this, right? But is there anything more satisfying to me than you know, after the Valiant collapse, hearing from um, patients and patients' families saying, you know, thank you, uh, now we can actually afford these drugs? Or in this case of Adtelum, hearing from students and saying, you know, thank you, we feel like no one is listening to us, and you are, are listening and you're sharing our story. So yeah, retail investors, as any market participant, understand the risks they are getting into when they trade securities, right? Um, but I take my, you know, what motivates me is the effect these, these campaigns have on the broader public. Bami, mean, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'd love to learn a little bit more about the type of investor that becomes an LP in a fund like this. And then for you as a money manager, the story that you find <laughs> resonates most with potential investors. Yeah, so <laughs> it's a very volatile strategy, as you can imagine. Um, so you really have to have very long-term oriented investors who are super levered to beta. Um, so usually that, that means endowments. So they're all institutional investors. So endowments, um, very large family offices um, who don't mind the volatility. They are just attracted by the absolute returns and the differentiated returns, the alpha, um, that can be generated by the shorts. Um, I've been very selective in uh, the investors I, I cultivate because part of me being able to do this job well means eliminating stresses as much as possible. So when things are go going rough, when I see you know, a short squeeze or I see Wirecard instituting a short selling ban, I don't want to have to be wasting my time you know, call after call with investors trying to comfort them or console them. I want investors who have confidence in my ability in those moments to make the right decisions. Um, so you really have to be thoughtful of that. That might mean it's gonna, it's gonna be really hard to raise money because your investors are, they're not investing in a strategy. They're not even investing necessarily in like a performance history. They're investing in you as a person and you know, their, their trust in your ability to do what you're say, you say you're gonna do. Um, so yeah, it's, it isn't, easy to raise money. Uh, you know, if I was going to go run like a long short fund, I'm sure I would be, you know, sitting on piles of cash right now, but that isn't what I want to do. Um, I want investors who believe in my, in my mission. Um, and that's really how it's been so far. Um, because that makes the, the, the hard times, the crises, um, a lot simpler to deal with. Okay, uh, I'm Travis. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I actually think short selling is like a super important part of the market, so uh, can you do that? Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd be curious just to hear a bit more about uh, your journey of like actually starting your own fund and, and like whether what's kind of lined up with your expectations of what that would be like versus not. Are you happy you did that and, you know, and when you did it um, or how you thought about that? There's never a good time to start a short-only fund, so I'm glad I did it as early as possible because I don't think it would be any different. You know, starting it early, you know, I started my fund when I was 
like 26, 27. Um, yeah, maybe some could argue that you should have waited a bit longer, but no, I think the, the experience of actually being in the market and doing it is more valuable than anything else. Um, I think some of this just comes from my personality and how I was raised. Uh, I'm very stubborn, you know, sort of take no prisoner. So if I'm working somewhere and they're telling me, you know, Kwame, we can't have Valiant be more than 10% of our portfolio, that, that doesn't work for me. Um, you know, when I have conviction, I want to be able to hit hard. I want to be able to double down on that position when the thesis is materializing. And I also want to do things my way. You know, I, I want to create the firm that I, I believe in and that because this is a really hard business. So you want to be able to wake up every day and feel proud um, of what you're doing and you feel motivated. Um, so yeah, I, I'm happy that I started the fund as early as I did. Um, and there really aren't any regrets because I think we've the worst thing that any portfolio manager can do is take the, that original essence of whatever they're really good at and lose it through the grueling process of running a business and raising money and markets. You know, the best thing I could do as a manager is stay true to what I'm really good at uh, because that's ultimately how I'm going to make money and you know, actually make an impact. Um, so the, the essence of what we do, you know, short selling these these special types of situations of fraud, predatory behavior, that hasn't changed um, this entire time that we've been doing it. Um, so yeah, we, we, we look for different ways to monetize this, and we look to different ways of how we might take action, like you know, going public on things. Um, but we're still very true to you know, what we originally set out to do. We'll do Anthony, and then over here. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I think price discovery is an incredible mission. And over the last decade, we've seen this explosion of passive investments. Uh, one of the things that worries me incentive-wise is when you know a mutual fund or a passive investor is the largest shareholder in most Fortune 500 companies, and when they own just as much of every competitor in an industry. Yeah. What are some unique challenges that are presented to short selling in a world now fill, filled with passive investors, and what opportunities do you see there? So I'd like to actually say that passive investing can be used positively by short sellers. And I'll use this example of Abtellum, this most recent short, as you know, it's a good example of this. Because it is largely just you know, passive investors, long onlys, big asset managers. Um, so the, these managers have no idea what, what they're owning. You know, it's just because this company has traded for over 30 years. So they own it. Um, so no one is doing the kind of work we're doing. So when we release that, these are smart people, right, that run these funds. So they see a well-researched, well-cited report, and then they start to think, you know, maybe we should reconsider holding this. Um, and the first people that I heard from when I put the research out were those holders. They reached out. They wanted to understand, you know, how can you, you know, can you assist us with our valuation? Um, what kind of assumptions are you making? Um, so. You know, sometimes it's, you, you can take these situations where there's like no information or it's very quiet and very passive and present the market with new information. And even those passive managers will still have to, at some point, take that into consideration. Yeah, um, thanks for sharing. It's a very intriguing topic. And I'm wondering, like, when you just say um, you're going to decide the right moment to take the short position, yeah, I'm curious how you decide it is the right moment. Because if it's short earlier, then the market didn't move, then it might trigger the margin call. So yeah. Yeah, so as, as short sellers, you, you already are well aware of the margin clerk coming and knocking on your door. So you, you know, you, you try to avoid situations where that's going to happen. Um, so in this case of Atelum, you know, I can say with confidence that we were basically like 90% plus percent of the entire short interest before this week. Um, and we like situations like that. You know, we like to be the only ones um, because we have better control of the situation. We, all, we'll, we understand better the dynamics of how it will trade. There are fewer counterparties for you know, risks that we have to deal with. Um, so you won't find us in like the meme stocks, um, right, that are heavily shorted, where the thesis is already well known by everyone in the market, even if we agree with the thesis. 
just because we know that um, you know we we won't necessarily be able to um, exit our position um, in times of crisis, right? Because you know just as on the way down, um, hedge funds often like create a panic for the exits. Same thing can happen in a short squeeze, right? And it just drives it higher. So we try to just avoid situations like that. And in general, now you know with positive rates, um, we we get paid on the cash balances that we get from shorting our stocks. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a good time to be a short seller in that sense. So that's your hand. Yeah, thank you so much for being here um, and for the work that you do. It, it seems to me that part of accountability in dealing with companies that are committing fraud or acting unethically, obviously journalism is a component, regulation is a component, and evidently short selling. Um, what are what is the role that, that short sellers play in a healthy financial system? And if the incentives are producing companies that are committing fraud, what would a healthier financial system look like specifically? Yeah. So I, I do want to make clear that most of the short selling in the market isn't really being done on the you know, basis that there's fraud, right? They aren't, people aren't going and doing this kind of research in general. Um, but it is a, a tool for price discovery. So if you look at the data um, on short selling over time, um, high short interest or rising short interest is really an indicator of stock prices that will eventually fall or accounting issues in those companies. Um, so it's, a, it's an effective tool for price discovery because investors can look at short interest and reassess their own positions. Um, you know, and then there's, of course, the argument, you know, short selling, it pr promotes liquidity because it allows investors to take on additional leverage and, you know, buy more stocks. Um, so there's that. Um, but you know, what's the end goal here? For, you know, how do we reduce companies that are engaged in fraud? Um, I don't know if short selling is necessarily going to you know, be the ultimate solution here. Um, it is an effective solution in some cases because a lot of these executives, the, the one thing they care about the most is their stock. Um, so even if you know, they have lawsuits and regulatory investigations and all of that happening in the background, they kind of say that it's immaterial or it's not an issue. Um, whereas when a stock price, like at Tellum, when it goes down 20%, you know, that's, that is their wallet that is getting you know, thinner and thinner, right? So that forces them to care. And that forces them to take those other risks a lot more seriously and provide greater transparency to investors. Um, but nothing is going to change if there isn't enforcement, right? Um, you know, we need to have some high profile cases where people are going to jail. Um, but you know, this is what's kind of been disappointing of you know, the, the last, you know, as long as I've been doing the business, in this business, you know, you, you have these characters who are so clearly almost like making fun of the rest of us, um, yet they continue to get away with it, um, or they are just, you know, given these settlements, and what happens with the stocks on settlements? The stocks, stocks go up, you know, oh, you, you've gotten rid of this. You, you, you paid, you know, a couple billion dollars, but, you know, the stock is free to go up after that. Um, so that's not really going to change behavior. Um, so there needs to be a change in how we enforce, um, you know, how, how we actually enforce these situations. Putting people in jail uh, would be a start. As a tail to that enforcement problem, it seems that the UK is moving toward less transparency. The US is maybe trying to move to, toward more transparency. Can you speak to the, the recent changes in the SEC and what your role <laughs> has been there? Because I think that's a pretty important story. Yeah, so I've, I've been uh, the, the, the lone advocate for short selling. Um, <laughs> all over the world, basically. So this started in the, the wake of the, the meme stock rallies in um, 2021, uh, even though I wasn't involved in any of that. Uh, that meme stock rally had prompted the SEC to reconsider disclosures around short sales. Um, and one of the, the rules they were considering was individual disclosure of short positions. So me, as FAMI, I would have to disclose, yeah, I've, I'm starting to short this company at Tellum. Um, so what, the second I disclose a short, pe the market is looking, oh, she must be doing, you know, there must be fraud there. And then before I even can have my position built up, um, the market already sees it and they, they kind of crowd around that short and I, I lose my business case, right? I, there's no way that investors will give me money if everyone already knows what I'm doing. Um, so what, and, and then the other issue is short sellers face greater risk of issuer retaliation. Um, so that means lawsuits, that means intimidation, that means private investigators following you around. In the case of you know, criminal organizations, that could mean you know, getting, having a hitman like punch you outside of your house, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, 
it's a risky business. So it's not easy. There, there's already so many hurdles, including regulatory hurdles, to be a short seller. Um, so basically, I was going to Congress, you know, and senators, representatives, the SEC, uh, all the way up to Gensler, um, CFTC, and presenting my case. You know, presenting who I am, what I do, what has happened to me, and why they shouldn't have individual disclosure of short sales. Um, and they said, we believe you, Fami. <laughs> we agree with you. Um, so they decided to instead go with aggregated disclosure, which means that investors, all of us, we can see what the you know, total level of short interest in a stock, um, but we don't see who is shorting it, which I think is, is totally fair, because we're still getting that information. Um, so that was in the US. So then I've moved to London. So I've taken this uh, advocacy work with me to Europe. Um, so recently, the UK, um, His Majesty's Treasury, has come out and said they would also like to reconsider their uh, rules around short selling. Um, because right now, they have public disclosure above a certain threshold. They're looking of removing that public disclosure and only have uh, disclosure instead directly to the regulator. It seems that you must be a very popular person among short sellers doing all this public interest work for them. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. You'd have to ask that. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, your, for being here and for your time. Um, what I think is interesting, or I've always thought is interesting about the meme stocks, is these are entities that folks who had interacted with those brands were likely the retail investors. So a lot of those folks probably went to GameStop as a kid. A lot of mm -hmm. folks go to the movies. Um, but the, a lot of the companies that you short, you know, are kind of very commonly, I would say, like from industries that have a low sentiment. So nobody likes pharmaceutical companies. Nobody likes for-profit colleges for the most part. Yeah. Um, to what extent do you consider, you know, public sentiment or likability in your investment thesis post meme <laughs> stock era? So I don't consider it in like, you know, how does it affect my, like the way people perceive me? The way I consider it is if a company is one no one will miss if it were to go away, that's a good short, right? So there is no nostalgia. It's not a company that goes around making people happy, uh, regardless of the fundamentals. So we, we ideally are finding companies that, you know, if they w went bankrupt tomorrow, no one would miss them. Hi, Fami. I'd love to know how you think about risk. So if a short position isn't going the way you want, how do you think about when to double down versus yeah. when to get out? Yeah, so if the price is moving against us and we don't know why, then First, we have to do a deep dive into understanding like, what's the dynamics there. So some of that might be um, like, as far as research into the company, but a lot of that is getting color from you know, brokers, banks, other um, traders to see why you know, is someone buying it? Is there some kind of like, trade, like block trade that's happening? Uh, so we try to understand what's the reason. And once we ascertain what that reason is, we'll make a decision based on that. Um, so if, if, for example, the company is worried about some bad news, so you know, the, the gossip on the street is that they're pulling the shares that are available for, for lending, um, so no one can short more stock. right? So that's, of course, going to create a short squeeze, but that's a temporary sort of thing, right? because they're, they're doing this because they expect bad news. Um, so in a situation like that, we would try to secure as much shares to borrow as possible so that we can short more. Um, but if it's going up and there is, um, it's because it's going to be included in a major index, um, that means the flows will always be against us, regardless of what kind of fundamental news hits. Um, so if the flows are against us, then we will you know, readjust our risk, you know, covering the position or at least reducing the position, um, because we know we'll lose money in the short term. Last one. Hi, thank you so much for coming. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between short sellers and activists. Obviously, activism is a less good tool for corporate fraud because you're not going to join the board and tell management not to be less fraudulent. Yeah. But in cases that are less fraud and more sort of companies acting badly or, or strategically acting wrong, are they at all complements, competitors, or are they just doing different things? Yeah, I think um, we, we have a pretty complementary relationship, not just with activists, but with long onlys. Um, and also sometimes with credit investors, uh, because these are individuals who are doing similar amounts of work um, com you know, compared to your traditional asset manager. Um, so any fund that is doing more due diligence has some kind of synergy with short sellers. So oftentimes that means they'll come across a company, and it might not fit within their portfolio, but they'll send it to us, and vice versa. So I, I wouldn't say it's, it's competitive, um, but we, we try to help each other um, most of the time. Before I ask you my last question, again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Professor Admani, for having us. Lisa and Loretta, thank you 
for hosting, uh, and thank you to the CASI leadership. Mike, I appreciate you and the tech team. I, it seems to me that we started today talking about narratives, and we've sort of continued that. There is a narrative that short sellers are cynics and pessimists. <laughs> I would argue that cynicism and skepticism are not the same thing. And I would argue further that actually short sellers have to be the most optimistic of the bunch. You must believe that while in the short term markets are volatile, in the long term they're efficient. If that's right, if my assumption there is right, and you can tell me I'm wrong, I'm so curious where your optimism and where your resiliency comes from and where it's going to take you next. <laughs> I think you're, that that is a fair assessment um, because I think the the greater the greatest believers in market efficiency have to be short sellers because otherwise we're, we're just going to lose all of our money, right? Um, but I think it also is um, at least for me not just about the markets but in, in as far as the systems around us um, and and just the fact that we believe that people out there regulators enforcement authorities they care about fraud and at some point it's you know it's going to be stopped. Um, and that's that's part of it. It is a, a faith in our systems and you know our our governments that tried to protect us. Um, so for me, when I find these situations, yeah, I'm going to be angry that the fact that these companies are getting away with it or abusing people, deceiving people. But I'm driven by the fact that I believe capital markets have the ability to actually correct that behavior and put an end to it, which I think is a net benefit to all of us. On behalf of Stanford and Kasi, thank you so much for joining us today.